Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Our guest today is Yuri Cataldo, the former founder and CEO of Bottled Water Company started from the wells on his parents' land in Indiana. I say former because the company no longer exists. And in this episode, you'll hear the full story of how Yuri came up with the idea, started the company, found amazing success, and then lost it all in the blink of an eye. Yuri is a good friend I've known for over two years, and I've never heard the story until now, and I can promise you it's a great one, so stick with us until the end. Normally I would ask more questions, but he was so passionate about the experience that he told it all in one breath, which actually makes it much easier to listen. Yuri recently released a book along with a co-writer called Be Left Behind, which helps anyone without a technical background understand what the hell Bitcoin is and why you should keep your eye on it. Today we celebrate Yuri's passion for creating a business and his vulnerability in telling how he lost it. Let's give Yuri a warm welcome. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Welcome to the show. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. It's been about a year. We were in Malta, a very beautiful island for a blockchain conference where I was trying to promote the upcoming launch of the what I believed would be Sidekick. And you actually interviewed me for your podcast back then. So what has your last year looked like since we last met? Sure. Well, so thank you, Sean, for having me on the show. That's This is a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I kind of wish we were in Malta right now. It's too bad. What's happened in the last year? A lot. A lot of that has to do with what everybody is going through, which is just this uh, lovely pandemic. At the start of 2020, I uh, released a book that I have been co-writing with my fellow co-podcaster. And so that came out just ahead of when everybody else in the world shut down. So it was released in February, somewhere in the middle of February. I had a lot of uh, speaking gigs lined up in the States and other places. And then suddenly overnight, everything goes away. And we're trying to figure out how to market a book in a world that no longer exists and how to do speaking engagements in a world that that where the commonplace no longer exists. So that was a bit difficult. Most of those speaking is, I think, will come back around at some point. But between March and June, there was nothing. Around June, events started popping up again, and they're all virtual. And so I've, I've since then been doing a lot more speaking engagements, not necessarily about the book, but just in what my day job is and a few other things. You know, I, I, <laughs> I say I wish I had a lot more details to talk about with like 2020, but that's like in my world, 2020 has been kind of a rebuilding year where I've just been. Focusing on like what to do with the book and what can potentially happen after that. Um, so the book, which I, have, I guess I've not introduced, is a book, an intro book on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency called "Be Left Behind," and the the idea behind it was an introductory book written for anybody, uh, primarily people who don't have computer programming backgrounds uh, and who are not like in- extensively computer literate. So. Uh, the like the test case was for my mom basically, so we my co-author and I we we wrote it so that anybody can get an idea of the landscape and make decisions for themselves, which is what I'm a, a true you know believer in. It's it's doesn't matter what I think about Bitcoin, it, it matters what you think about Bitcoin and how you see that in your ultimate financial future and the cryptocurrency space. So as much as I can educate everybody on what's happening so they can make their own decisions rather than, you know, listen to 
you know, whatever person pops up, like right now, like random people just coming out of nowhere, uh, who are all experts because everybody's an expert when the market goes up. What you've described as your experience for the year is kind of similar for a lot of people, if not maybe everybody. I, I'm sure you've heard of the term black swan. This pandemic is something like a black swan event that most people would consider is impossible to predict and yet radically changes the face of our existence in a very short amount of time to a point where you basically adapt or die. Some people literally die. Some people financially die. Their business is shut down. Um, societies shut down, economies get ruined, things like that. I knew that by the time they were willing to admit to the world what was going on, it was too late and there was already going to be infections in other countries. It just would be a matter of time. So I could tell very early on that this was going to be a massive event. And I tried to tell everybody that I could, you know, prepare. Like wherever you are right now, just stay there. It's going to be 18 months. Just stay there. And they're like, no, no, no. Like it's the flu. Like, you know, no, guys, like this is this is a life changing event. You have to be ready for it. And they called me Chicken Little. And guess what? Unfortunately, I'm right. While everybody was going about their day going, well, I hope this ends like so I can go back to my normal life. I was thinking, OK, well, my business is not going to survive if I keep going down this route. Um, so on a professional level, it's been an, an amazing opportunity. And personally, it's been an amazing opportunity because I'm a, also a firm believer in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I remember you guys writing the book and talking about it and preparing to promote it and all that. So it's awesome that you got it out. I'm sorry that, you know, things uh, turned out the way they did in terms of not being able to promote properly. But but I think it also gives you an opportunity because now that events are uh, digital, you could literally do a speech in, you know, five different countries in the same day. So a lot of the speaking engagements I have, book related and non-book related, are from other parts of the world. And they happen, but still, I miss the travel part of it. And I miss like us sitting down beforehand and having a drink and talking about what your project was and other things. Like I, I miss those parts of conferences. They've tried to recreate them virtually, but it's still not the same. I never went to as many conferences as you did. Malta, in fact, was probably one of the only conferences I've ever been to. So let's talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship. You used to have a company and it was a water company. Tell me about how you got the idea to start that company. I was the founder and CEO of an international award-winning bottled water company called Indigo H2O. It's been shut down since 2015. I still have people who email me on a monthly basis asking when the water will come back. My background is in theater. I'm a classically trained set and costume designer. And 10 years ago, I... I uh, was working on Broadway until the uh, the economy caught up. So the I was living in New York, the economy crashes, everything stops, um, which then trickles down to the theater world. And at the same time, I was not in a great relationship and I got a divorce. And so everything in my life changed immediately, pretty much overnight. I had to, like without any income and like sitting on debt and everything else, I moved back to Indiana, which is where I'm from, and I lived with my parents. And I had to just work to pay off the bills I had and to figure out what was next. I was able to work as a as an adjunct professor because I had a master's degree, which, by the way, pays like absolute shit. Uh, I think I got paid like two thousand dollars to teach a class. I actually begged for extra. I they maxed me out at teaching five classes. And they were like, we can't allow you to teach anymore. So I was like making, so that was like, that's $10,000 for an entire semester, which is nothing. And so I had to figure out other ways to make, make money. I was cleaning offices at night. I also worked as a, a server in a, a restaurant, which was an interesting experience at that time because uh, other people who were highly educated were also serving. So it was like, it was me. There were two lawyers I was working with. There was someone who just graduated from medical school. My, I remember my boss joking about how he had the smartest wait staff like in Indiana because we were all most of us like were Notre Dame other Ivy League schools uh, in a lot of scientists you know all kinds of, of areas um, but that was just what was happening especially in the Midwest at that time I realized I had to do something else to break what I was doing and so I talked my way into getting a job for a, a TV station and so I sold TV advertisements to a lot of small businesses. And through that, I spent a lot of time 
just chatting with small businesses to understand what their needs and what they were doing. And at the same time, as I was learning how local small businesses are run, how people thought through their ideas, it dawned on me that if I wanted to get out of my situation, I needed to, you know, either get a different type of education or start a company. And I just, uh, I decided to start a company. Other part of it was that my, my parents and my relatives are all entrepreneurial. They all own restaurants and their own businesses. They're, they're um, uh, Italian immigrants. And so they all have some kind of side hustle or business or multiple businesses. You know, they'll mow lawns in the summertime. So Christmas tea, Christmas trees in the wintertime and also plow your, your driveway kind of types of businesses. And so I've been around that my entire life. So the idea of starting a company was like, oh yeah, I'll just like, I need an idea, but I'll just do that because everyone else around me does it. I'm used to that part. And so I spent six months trying to figure out like what it is I wanted to do. And I basically just asked everybody that I knew who had a company or was around, you know, business owners, I would just ask them for advice and just like what we're doing right now, just have a conversation with them, how, why they got started, what was it about their idea that was interesting. And I just interviewed tons and tons of people while I tried to figure out what I wanted to do. And at the same time that I had this day job, I would take extra long breaks and I would go to Barnes and Nobles and I would just get, get a, cu- a cup of coffee and just go through and start reading every business book that I found interesting and just like go through the shelves. I actually would go in the shelves with a bookmark, put it back and then come back the next day and then where I was and then kept going. And I did that multiple times. So through all that, I was figuring out exactly like, you know, how, how to start, how to think about running companies, how to test your ideas. And so I came up with a few ideas. The idea of the bottled water company came from a couple of different things. It was my own interest like unique obsession with bottled water that had come from years ago so so when i was 17 i was diagnosed with a condition called thalassemia minora which means that i have red blood cells that are smaller than the average person but basically what happened was i was like living a normal life and then suddenly i was exhausted all the time it was like if you've ever had mono that's was like my day-to-day for a very long time and so i Uh, try to push through it, but it was just getting worse and worse and worse. So I went to the the doctors and they couldn't quite find anything. Uh, Once it was finally diagnosed, there isn't a a treatment for it. So my doctor was just like, well, if you take iron supplements, you should be fine. And so I did that and it didn't really work. And at the same time, some of my, my parents' friends introduced us to a natural doctor that they were going to see. And so I went to go see her. And basically her system was to figure out what vitamins and minerals my body was lacking and then help introduce those and, and approach health from a holistic way rather than like, this is what your, your problem is. And so we went through a series of tests with her and, and found out what I was lacking. And part of it was I was severely dehydrated and I wasn't getting enough water and helping to flush out all, all all the things. And so from that moment on, I started looking at like, okay, so, you know, what it is about water that's so interesting and like, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest, so we had really good groundwater. What was that like versus city water with chlorine and a few other things? And so I just became a little bit obsessed with it. I started doing some research, and um, then I forgot about it for a while. And then coming back to Indiana, I'm back in this environment again. And so I am thinking about water and where I was in New York and, and you know, tasting New York city water and then you know New Haven city water. I'm back in the country where it just, it tastes different and it always felt different. And so I wanted to know why. And so I started, I, so I bottled up some of our water and went and got it tested and found out that there was, because it's, you know, there's a high mineral content where I am in Indiana. Um, there was a lots of calcium and magnesium naturally occurring in the water. We have hard water and hard water has naturally occurring calcium and a few other things. And so the groundwater I was associated with, from these wells that were on my parents' property were already naturally healthier than a lot of other places. And so I was like, okay, well, if the water here is already great, then, you know, what if I started maybe a bottled water company or something like it's, it didn't seem like that big of a a thing at the time because I honestly had no, I no idea about the industry or what any of that was like. I just knew my parents' property, there was really good water and I had access to it, like just because we had multiple wells. And so I was not worried about 
water levels on that side. And so I just started systematically going through and thinking through how to actually get this going. And part of that was, you know, deciding on type of bottled water company that I would want to buy from. So most bottled water is recycled, you know, tap water in a plastic bottle. And I knew that I didn't want to see whatever product I came up with sitting in a landfill that was like, or floating in the ocean that was, that was contributing to this garbage industry that the bottled water industry has, has come into. I also wanted to find a way to give back to either the local community or to other communities who need access to fresh water. So at the same time, I was chatting with some of the founders of Ryan's Well in Canada. Um, at the I think there's also shortly after um, a couple other, there's a couple of bottled bottle water companies that started at the same time who did the, like, you buy our bottled water and then we'll help you build wells in, in a, an emerging country. Um, and so I was looking at their model, like the early social enterprise types, the, you know, buy one, give one types of, of things. And so I was trying to develop that model, same time developing the company and not knowing how to do really any of this because the most difficult part of all this was, okay, so I've got water. Now, how do I put it in a bottle? And even more so, like, how do I ship it? Like if, if I'm going to not just do a regular plastic bottle, how do I use another container and at the same time, I was looking at, you know, plastic, looking at aluminum, how does that work? And then how do I physically get it into the hands of, of somebody? And so I was fortunate that one night my parents had a, a dinner party and two of their friends started in uh, 1998, this small local furniture store that became the world's largest on online retailer of furniture. It was, it, it was called furniturefine.com. And they they started in the in the early uh, the early 90s and then it rose and then everything went online they got bought out by uh, some large companies they took the company public like they hit the height of the original dot com bubble and then the moment they sold the company everything came crashing down and like all their stock options were gone and lost and like they tried to buy back the company it was it was a huge thing but they learned so much from like starting this small local furniture company and then launching it online and seeing what happens there. Um, and they were just sitting by me at dinner time. And so I had a couple glasses of wine and I was like, Hey guys, let me, I've got this idea for this bottled water company. Can I just pitch it at you and see what you guys think? And they're like, yeah, why not? So that evening I stumbled through whatever I thought was like a pitch of my idea and through the steps of kind of figuring out how to do everything they thought it was awesome and they wanted to help me. And so that was like my first real mentorship with them, which was fantastic because they already knew how to start online companies. They already had some distribution ideas. Like they already had done this because they were shipping furniture around the world. And so the idea of shipping bottled water, they were like, oh yeah, we just got to scale it down. We got to figure this out. And so it was like every week they would help me come up with assignments that I would have to figure out and do um, just to get, the different elements of, of this, of like how to bottle it, the distribution part, um, storage, kind of all that, all that beautiful stuff. And so what I ultimately ended up doing was I didn't have any money to actually launch this huge company, which is what you really need for a bottled water company. On, on average, the plant alone costs around like five to $10 million. And then everything else goes up from there. So I had to get creative with all of this. And so the bottled water part, I knew that I wanted to use glass. The only thing about glass I knew was that my dad, and I had been helping him for years, bottle wine. So I knew how to get wine, wine bottles. I knew where to buy them. I knew how to store them, cork them, like make all that sanitary. I knew how to fill wine bottles with fermented grape juice. And so that's what I did in the beginning. I was fortunate in that my dad had already built this freestanding building on our property because he wanted to have a catering company. And so I was sitting in a already approved by the Department of Health facility that was basically just a large catering kitchen with two very large sinks. And so I came in, he was like, I don't really care what you do with this. So I rebuilt part of it to be a bottled water plant where I had a section set up where I would bottle all the water, store the bottles, sanitize them. Like, so I set up the system and then other parts of it, I set up as like a labeling system 
And then there was another part where I was, I called it my warehouse area where I stored the bottles that were full and, and sealed them up. And then the ones that were empty and how to like send them through a system. So I, I set up my own kind of internal working system on that one. And the early days I did it all myself and it was all by hand. And so before I, any, I launched anything, I, um, so I, I found the bottles. I went to a local wine store. I bought one bottle of every color they had. And then a week later, I went to a party with a friend of mine. And I walked in there with like six different bottles of water. Like I put corks on them and I just filled them full of, of the water I was testing. And I went around to people and I asked them how much they would buy, how much they would pay for this bottle of water. And I got laughed at a lot. Um, I think the first sale I made was for like a quarter or actually maybe it was five cents. And so I gave them a bottle for five cents. I'm like, great, thank you. And at the end of the night, I had one bottle left and it was the blue bottle and it sold for $5 because the young lady wanted it for a vase. And so I knew that for whatever reason, that blue color was what she wanted, like what she really latched onto. And she talked about how much like, you know, she tried the water and, and, Everybody was there. They were all from the Midwest, so they're all very polite anyway. Um, and so she was drinking it, and she was talking about you know, how it was like great tasting water. But apart from that, she just talked about how much she loved the blue bottle and how like attracted she was to the blue bottle. And so I was like, great. So now for my bottled water company, I got this part. So I know people, at least in this, in this individual case, will pay more money for this blue color, and they'll – talk to me about why. And again, this is a small test test case of one person, but everybody else who bought the other bottles didn't do that. They just bought it and were like, great, thank you. And then kind of went away. But she spent extra time talking about why this blue color was so important to her. And so for my test case, I was like, great, let's go with blue. Blue is beautiful anyway. Like who doesn't want crisp, clean, blue-ish types of, of water. In the area I live in, there was also, it's a very industrial area. So I did more research and I found there were actually label companies up the road from my parents' house and then shipping box companies. And so I went to each of those and I got samples and I got quotes. And so I came back and I compiled everything. And so that I knew that if I wanted to launch the company, I could just turn the key and go for it. But in order to give the idea of, of like selling what it was, I Photoshopped everything together. So I taught myself Photoshop, Photoshop the label onto the bottle in nice locations, the Mentors I had helped me get this terrible, terrible website up. Like mid-January 2011, I launched what was called Simple Water. So simplewaterstore.com was launched. And I had just enough money to do a month and a half of Google AdWords to see if there was any interest in this company. And so I turned, the, turned that all on and I was like, great, we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, and every day I was kind of tweaking the AdWords and just seeing what was happening. A week goes by and I get my first sale. It is for a case of water. And this person, again, I had no idea about pricing either. So I just guessed. Uh, this person bought the first case of water. I think it was for $89. And so I was like, great, I'm, I'm, I'm almost in business. Like, so I've got enough, enough interest so far. Someone at least is, is kind of interested. Well, let's wait and see. The, the fortunate thing about at least the law anyway, I don't know if it's changed, but you're legally al allowed 60 days before you can, you have to deliver a product to somebody. So when you like see that as seen on TV and they're like, it's four to six weeks for shipping, it doesn't take four to six weeks of shipping. It means the product hasn't been created yet. And they're just seeing if there's enough interest before they go through the process of, of buying this because they can let, they, they can still cancel the order. And so going into this, I knew that. So I knew I had once he bought his product, I had six weeks before I had to deliver him something or give him his money back. And so I kind of, I ramped up my AdWords campaign and then just sale after sale after sale after sale came in. And so after I'd reached my first thousand dollars worth of sales in the, in the first week and a half, I knew that I had something here and I was ready to pull the trigger. And so I went out with that money and I bought labels and I bought bottles and I bought caps and, um, Initially, I was actually, I found a, a cheaper way to ship it by using USPS prepaid labels and just wrapping the hell out of the bottles. And so I knew I could control certain things and then just like pulled the trigger and launched it. So like the company was officially live in, like in February of 2011. Sales continually 
started going up and up and up, which was awesome. And I was learning how to tweak the distribution, how to start working with retailers, how to start finding international distribution. What does it mean to wholesale? Like all of this stuff I learned on the job and had no idea what I was doing. I was on, like, to be honest, totally was just making up as I was, was going along. Um, after reading a bunch of things, asking people questions, after the first six months, I realized that, so the name was originally called Simple Water. When I started Googling my water brand, the first thing that popped up was the search term Simple Water Scam. So as it turns out, there was this company in Canada that was, that, that was selling filters, and they would go in to older people's homes and tell them their water was garbage and then sell them a bunch of stupid filters. And they were doing it over and over and over and over again. So much so they were being sued by the government. And after realizing that, I'm like, well, I shouldn't have a bottled water company named where I can't own the search rights. I also didn't own the website, simplewater.com, like somebody else owned that. I couldn't get the, the trademark to it. Like, so everything about that pointed to the fact that I just needed to pick a new name. And so at the same time I was running this, I still had day jobs just to pay down my debt. And at this point, I was, I talked my way back into being a professor. And so I was sitting down for coffee one time with a friend of mine, and I was like, I need to come up with a new name, help me out with something. And so we would just started spitballing things back and forth, most of which were stupid, terrible, garbage ideas. But at some point, he was like, looked at the bottom, he's like, yeah, you know, like, what other some names for blue? And we started naming them, he's like, Indigo. That's kind of that, that's kind of interesting. Like indigo H. Well, like yeah, like water's H two O. Indigo H two O. Indigo H two O. And he kept on saying it, and I was like, okay, that's that has this weird, cool kind of rhyme to it that's happening. And I turned to some random person who was also at this cafe, and I was like, hi, I just have a question for you. What do you think of the name Indigo H two O? And she looked at me, and she started singing it back at me. She started singing Indigo H two O. Like I was like. That's so interesting and bizarre. Thank you so much. That's like, and she just like kept on singing it, which was so strange. But I was like, if that's, if whatever random thing just happened here, like somebody is so excited at this name that they would sing it back to me, there's something there. And so that's when the name Indigo H2O was born from. And it just so happened that nobody owned the rights to anything. So I got the trademark. I got, like, I own the website, the, you know, Twitter Instagram, Facebook, all of those, I owned them all. So that was like, great, that's even better because I can own this name and then launch from there. And then from the moment I changed the name, like everything just got easier and better with the company. The bottled water was accepted into the gift baskets for the MTV Video Music Awards in 2012. That got a ton of press because from there, uh, I learned how actually to... Uh, to get better at PR and marketing. Before then, I was kind of like stumbling and figuring it out. You know, being from a small town in Indiana and then suddenly having this product, this locally produced product in an international award show was a really easy way to get press. So I contacted some local reporters at what I was doing and instantly they're like, yeah, we're writing stories. And so I think I still have this, the original newspaper article somewhere around here. There's like the local newspaper about, you know, photograph of my water in the paper. And it was awesome. Like I ran to the local grocery store to find it and take a photograph of, of the actual article. And then again, huge spike of sales happened. It was there I realized that the more times I could get my water known publicly in places that I could start controlling some of these huge spikes on top of what else I was doing. And so I just had a systematic approach where I was targeting award shows for inclusion on top of my other other sales of like getting included into traditional grocery stores like Whole Foods and a few other places. And so right after that, I got into the Emmys. I got into the Golden Globes. So every year I would just get in another award show or get into another type of event. And then every time I did it, I got better and better at my PR pushes. And so I was featured in more articles and more magazines, which, you know, led to, you know, Inc. and Forbes and a few other places um, that were just kind of showcasing the, the company and what I was doing and then building and building and building from there. And I got into Whole Foods and Whole Foods, they loved the product so much that they originally bought enough for one store, which is my local store. And then they expanded from there. And then I was in like five in Chicago and then it started expanding further from there. So everything about my company was getting better and better year after year. And I was learning how to 
handle the sales and distribution and marketing and everything else of a bottled water company. Uh, I was able to hire some people. So I, I had some friends who were getting their MBA actually at, at uh, the Notre Dame Mendoza School. And so I had some MBAs working for me, helping me bottle water at night and then run the company in the daytime. And it was, it was this awesome experience. And then in 2015, everything changed. So in February, I was included into the Oscar gift baskets and it was completely amazing. And so I, um, I knew about it ahead of time, started my PR push. And at the same time, then I skipped over this a couple of times, but there are international events that award uh, medals to water for, for the taste of it. Uh, very much like beer tastings and champagne tastings and uh, wine tastings, there are water tastings. And the biggest one is in uh, Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. It happens every February. And I heard about it at some point. I don't remember what. I think I was just trying to find a way to get awards for my company. And I came across this. And in 20, I think it was 2012, I just sent my bottle of water in, not expecting anything. And I won third place. And I was like, that's awesome. And then I sent it in the next year. So it was 2013, 2014. I sent it in again. I won second place. And so going into this, into 2015, I was like, this is going to be awesome. You like every year I would finagle with the taste of the water because I could control that. And by adding more or less minerals to things, and I would do like this whole tasting event leading up to it. So I could send them what I thought was the best tasting water I possibly could. 2015 in February, I get included into the Oscar gift bags is fantastic and i knew this a week ahead of time so the week leading up to that i'm getting a lot of f- absolutely fantastic press from everywhere like i was owning the news cycle in indiana illinois ohio like all around me it was it was great i had more interviews than i'd ever had in my entire life i was actually able to do a lot of on-site tv interviews at whole foods which i had to get special permission for because they don't like it when companies do that but because i had been you know, because of my story, because I had made friends with the store manager, they loved it. And so like every day for a week, it was another TV station who drove to me and interviewed me next to these large special things that, that were built up for my bottled water company. Like, so we go into it that weekend, that Saturday night, then I win the award for the best tasting water in the world from this Berkeley Springs thing. And, and I was actually speaking at a conference in Chicago that night. Um, about creative entrepreneurship. And so as I'm driving home in a snowstorm, they call me and they're like, the people on the other end were like screaming on the phone with excitement, Um, partially because they knew I was getting all of this publicity about being the Oscar water. And so there was this, I was kind of the favorite going into this, uh, mostly because they knew that if I won, I would give them more publicity because I was better at it than they were. So they, they call me, I'm driving like, having like the night of my life on there. I get home the next day, of course, the Oscars happen and there's a big whole big deal about my water being there because I had won that that night, like press releases went out and they made a bunch of phone calls. So, so starting on that Sunday in this snowstorm, I was doing another set of interviews about having the best tasting water in the world. And so I drove back again to Whole Foods and did like six in a row interviews with TV stations whole new TV stations about what it was like to be the Oscar water and to have the the water that was the best tasting in the world. And then this really cool thing happened where people just started like coming into the store to buy the water while I was still being interviewed for things. Like we sold out almost immediately because these were live television streams going out. And so people were driving like an hour away to come to the Whole Foods in Mishawak, Indiana to buy the Oscar water and to meet the founder. It was like this weirdest thing I've ever experienced because who really cares about bottled water that much? Well, apparently a lot of people do. And so that was great. So for the following week, then I was getting more interviews. Sales were exploding. Like my sales for for that following two week period went up like 3000 percent. I had distribution deals from around the world coming in. I had to hire a sales team. I was like, I finally hit the tipping point. I spent money and bought some new equipment so that the bottling was being more more, more automated. I bought a lot more inventory. I was looking at ways to buy a warehouse to expand operations. And then suddenly I got an email and everything changed. 
the State Department of Health decided of Indiana that my company appeared to not be operating at the level they thought I should. And by operating, I mean paying a certain level of taxes or being monitored at a certain level because every bottled water company and beverage company is regulated sometimes by the FDA, sometimes by the local authorities, depending on whether or not you ship interstate or, or outside the state. So they contact me and they say, well, we know, so we know that we gave you a permit to operate this company, but based off of everything we're seeing, we don't believe that you're a s small startup that you claim. We believe that you're a large international conglomerate that's trying to get out of paying taxes. So you are you have to officially stop right now until we can do an investigation. And so I was sent to cease, cease and desist uh, immediately, was told to shut down all operations. They told me I had to pull off like every bottle of water on the shelf. Fortunately for me, because I was so hot and popular, like everything sold out ahead of time. And so I was just stalling my distributors while I was trying to figure this out. I had to hire a beverage attorney, which I didn't know they existed, but they do. Chat with a beverage attorney really, really smart guy who hates government regulation like that. And we went to town and fought this. A couple of things happened. We found out where their assumptions were coming from. It was because of the fact that my publicity had gone so well and that I was everywhere that it was like freaking out people because they didn't think that a small startup could get that much press, especially locally. Once they realized their mistake, they just basically said they didn't care. So like I went into one of our meetings and it was the last meeting that my attorney allowed me to go into, but I was basically like, you know, you're like, you're, you're meeting the founder. I'm pretty much running this with a small group of people, but we are actually giving positive publicity to Indiana. Like you are now known for having the best tasting water in the world and not for the other garbage that's happening by our current governor, who is a piece of shit. Also not a good thing to insulting the governor when you're getting sued by the state apparently is not a good thing to do. I was like, you know, you're you're bankrupting a small business that's actually br bringing a lot of positive publicity to the state, and you're doing it for really stupid reasons. And they basically came to out that like they didn't care, like they wanted to make an example of my company because they didn't know how to regulate it, they didn't know how to think about it. All they knew is I was like falling into this area that they couldn't understand, and they wanted to make an example that that so other people wouldn't try to pull whatever the thing they thought I was pulling which wasn't anything. I was like, just like, I was operating a legitimate bottled water company that uh, was above and above what they actually even required in the beginning. And so we, my lawyer and I fought them. And the reality is I just didn't, I didn't have a lot of money. Like, it, like we fought them for a month and it's about what I could afford. And he came back to me and was like, listen, here's the deal. They are going to make an example of you for whatever reason. It doesn't make legal sense you piss somebody off at some point and I don't know who, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, you're someone's target. And so you can do two things. You can keep fighting them until you run out of money, which is going to happen pretty soon. They've got more money and more resources than you do, or you can close up shop right now and, you know, go build this somewhere else or just go do something else. And so that was a really difficult thing to think about with this company I had been running and, and built up and was doing so well for four years was now like, you know, having to be shut down because of some stupid politician or some other stupid person's opinion that wasn't based on anything factual. It took me a couple of days to kind of think through it, but I was like, you know what? I, I had a great run. This is a great company. You know, let me, I just like, I, I was tired of fighting. I was tired of a lot of things. And so I decided to just shut it down and then, you know, figure out what I could potentially do in the future. But I know that I didn't want to be in Indiana anymore. I didn't want to deal with the local politicians. I just, I was done and I wanted out. And so I was like, that's it. And so I think it was about April of 2015. I closed the doors to Indigo H2O and pulled all the products offline and shut everything up. Thank you for sharing your stories. Definitely comprehensive. So 
in a nutshell, what was the most important experience you learned from those four and a half years of starting, growing, a, I believe it was a multi-million dollar company, and then having that happen to you, shutting it down and moving on? What was the most important thing you learned that hopefully people can learn from your experience? To not get too married to your, your company. I wasn't a stranger to starting things like as a, as a designer. And I figured this out early on. A lot of my experience as a designer and going from the ideation to actually launching a theater experience was very similar to launching a company. It's not a, a straight apples to apples comparison, but a lot of the same ideas of like running through ideas and testing them out and the, you know, human centered type of approach to it is very similar to launching my company. One of the things I learned along the way there was not to get too married to an idea because things change all the time. Like when I was in theater, there was never enough money, there was never enough time, never enough resources. And so you had to just think on your feet and keep adapting and keep changing. And it was the same thing with my bottled water company. I probably did a much better job early on because I didn't have a bunch of funding and because I didn't have a lot of access to money. All I had access to was like my ingenuity and my um, ability to kind of just talk my way into rooms and to meet with people. And so being able to think creatively gave me a lot of um, motivation. It gave me a lot of just, um, yeah, ex I think it just, it helped with the evolution of what my company became, which allowed it to become so much stronger. Because what I thought of the company in the beginning was definitely not what happened in the end. It was an eventuality. I actually learned the power and sometimes negative power of publicity. Like an, until that nonsense happened to me in 2015, I never would have thought that getting too much publicity could have been a bad thing. But in some, some ways, it, it kind of is. <laughs> I say that particularly because I've, I've had another experience before where I was the CMO of another tech startup, and I got a lot of publicity for the founders. And it didn't affect it in the same way of the like, government regulations, but it affected them in a negative way. And sometimes that means it affects the founders and how they think about themselves and think about their product. Sometimes it's how the world views your, your product. And sometimes that can be a bad thing. So those are the two big things, but you know, ultimately it sucks that it doesn't exist anymore, but it was an amazing experience. And it's, it's, you know, it's the reason why I get to talk to you and why I get to talk to a lot of other people, because I figured out how to sell, like I figured out how to make water sexy. And like that's very few people have done that. I have figured out how to make water really fucking sexy and sell millions of dollars of it around the world. Yeah, it didn't work out and that sucks, but there's something there that was just so cool to think about, but it still was water. <laughs> so how can people find you online? My personal website is yurikataldo at gmail.com. I'm also uh, Yuri Cataldo on Instagram and Twitter uh, and LinkedIn. And But if you just go to yurikataldo.com, there's like there's my speaking gigs coming up. You can look at the bottled water if you want to, the books I have written, um, and then, you know, other things. I do a lot of side consulting based off of what I've learned in working in the tech world and then also the bottled water company. So I'm always happy to talk to people. Brilliant. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. This has been an epic journey. I hope everyone learned something from it. And thanks for your time. Great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. 